Let's finish this word. It's called the way of Jesus. And remember what we did a few weeks ago, well, perhaps about a month ago, we talked about Jesus being the way to God. I believe this, the more we worship Jesus, the more he reveals God to us. That's actually his role, to reveal God to us. As we lift him up, he unveils to us who God is and invites us into a deeper relationship. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you would open the door, then I would come in and I would sup or have fellowship with you. And I thank God for that. Then we also talked about Jesus being the way of truth. In other words, he is the way that God intended things to be. And you will testify that when we look around this world, much of what we see is not the way God intended things to be. And it is so entrenched that sometimes one lie spawns another spawns another until we begin to actually live out what God did not intend for us. Do you remember I told you that because there's only one race, watch how the enemy has worked a while. That's what it's called, it's a trick. Because there's only one race, the enemy has convinced us that we should subdivide ourselves into different races. And that doesn't even exist, but not only does he do that, he then pits us against each other and we then begin to talk about racism. And so the lie continues because if there's only one race, there can be no such thing as racism. But he perpetuates a lie. And our job as the body of Christ is to walk in truth to the best of our ability. And so we want to ask God, help us to walk in the truth. John said, I have no greater truth or greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. The third and last one, and then next week i want to share this really i was just talking to the lord this week i had this very strong sense unlike i've never gotten before that the lord has given us opportunities i believe to do his will to do his work i think the days are coming now where he is simply going to intervene and he's going to get the job done among those who are willing thy people shall be willing in the day of your power and so i just want you to just just surrender your life to him because one way or the other god is going to finish the work he's going to finish it and cut it short in righteousness that's not the question the question is will i participate in it or will he find someone else and i want him to use me any way that he sees fit to do whatever he desires. Today, I want you to listen to this word. It won't be very long. I'm gonna go through it very quickly. But Jesus is also the way of love. And I wanna show you some things about this. I'm sure you've heard many, many messages on, uh, you, had the, you had the notes uh, mixed up with the song. That was what we were just singing. <laughs> Not what I'm preaching. So don't get them started again. <laughs> Stay with the notes, son. Stay with the notes. All right. So watch this. This word here, love, will you agree? In my estimation, it is perhaps the most misused word in the English language. And perhaps the most trivialized of all words. So I've always often said this, and it takes intentionality. You can't really tell someone that you love their shoes. You can't because their shoe doesn't have the ability to reciprocate love back. But how often do we do, oh my God, I love your hair. <laughs> you, you really don't love their hair. It's a preference alike. But we shouldn't trivialize this word down to things that cannot reciprocate back to us. There are only several things that's worthy of love, one being God. The next one being my neighbor. Watch, he doesn't even ask me to love my dog. Are you okay with that? Now that's up to you, but he doesn't even ask. He says there are only two commandments, that you would love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as thyself. So in that equation, there are actually three groups of people that love is deserving of. 
One is God, two is me, three is others. You must understand it like that. A love for God must lead to a love for myself. Then I extend it to others. If you don't love yourself, you will struggle to love others and you will also struggle to love God. So he has no problems as long as you have it in order. Love for God leads to love for self because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, O God, and that my soul knoweth right well. And then when I have a strong love for myself, I can express that, express that to others. Let's, let's go through something. Um, here is, there are many words in the Bible. I'm going to show you something, especially in the New Testament that are used for love. There's three prominent words. Two are in the Bible. One is in the language of Koine Greek, and you will know them. This is the word that we know that is used for love most often in the Bible, specifically in your New Testament. The word is agape or agapeo. And this word speaks of, listen, God's infinite and eternal love. That's what agape is. It's God's infinite, eternal love. But what people do sometimes is they say, this is unconditional love. And they also come to a conclusion that there's love that has conditions. I'm going to show you that all love springs from this one and must be expressed consistently with this one. There is no love that has conditions attached to it. The moment you attach conditions to love, it's not love. So I'm going to show you how this, and we all, all of us, the one with the microphone and those without, we all have to work in this area to really work on that love factor. And people are hard to love sometimes. I'm hard to love, I know. So I won't pick on anyone. I know that I'm hard to love. Remember this definition. It's the fountainhead from which all other loves will flow. Agapeo. It means God is love. Now watch this, remember I said agape is God's eternal and infinite love. So when the Bible says God is love, watch closely, whatever God is, love must be that. Let me repeat that again. Whatever God is, love must be that. So if God is holy, then love must be holy. Got it? God is eternal, then love must be eternal. If God is truth, then love must be truthful. Whatever God is, love must be. That's important today because you've got people saying, I can love who I want to love. Okay, as long as that love is holy. <laughs> as long as that love is truthful. Because God is love. Love does not spring from anywhere else but from God. Out of God comes love. John puts it like this. Here is the text. He that loves, who, he that loveth not, does not know God. For God is love. Notice that? The knowledge of God is seen in one's ability to love others. So the knowledge of God is connected to the love of God. When you know God, it leads you to loving as God loves. Jesus quietly talks to his disciples one evening just before the cross and he says greater love than this hath no man that a man lay down his life for his friends friendship requires love if there is no love there is no no friendship now these are the words that I want to show you here's the first one agape or if you want to put an o on it agapeo you can simply say that's the love of god there's also this word, phileo or philia, and that is, listen carefully, that is the love of God extended toward my brother or sister. Watch, it's not a different kind of love. It's the love of God extended, can I say it this way, horizontally. This is where you get words like Philadelphia, city of brotherly <laughs> See the problem, right? You get books like Philemon, the one called to remember his slave and receive him back. This is brotherly love. 
Remember, this is critical. The way you love your brother must be an extension of the way God loves you. Careful with the amens. <laughs> Let me repeat it again. I don't know if you're getting any. The way you love your brother should be an extension or a continuity of the way God loves you. No new commandment. This is an old commandment that you love each other as I have loved you. See the work of the church, right? Loving people the way God loves them. Watch eternally. That means you don't love them today and throw them away tomorrow. That's our definition. Something happens. I know I'm guilty. Something happens and we just toss them away. That's me loving people the way I choose to love them, not the way God loves them. You've got to love them when they're clean and when they're dirty because that's how God loves them. That's phileo or philia. Then you have eros. You know what that is, right? Eros is not really in the Bible. It's in Greek language. Eros is erotic or love that you extend to a sexual partner in the context of marriage. Watch closely now. That would mean that you should not sleep with anyone that you don't love the way God loves them. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Because love transcends sex and there are times I'll give you this definition there are times when sex is not lust love it's in fact lust and we have to know the difference so and, and this is why it's important eros is actually love expressed intimately and so what should happen how can I say this without it being too yes too graphic that love relationship should feel like God loving me <laughs> and God loving her. Because it's the extension of agape. That's all it is. And so these are the words that we have for, for love in the Bible. Let's just go a little further now. Watch. God is love, so therefore whatever God is expressing, He expresses it through love. This is one of the reasons why, if, if taught properly, the idea of hell hurts the heart of God because he loves people so much that just the, con the, the idea of sending them out of his presence, it wounds the heart of God. So you see what God is really saying is, I love you so much, I just want you to reciprocate love back to me. Because here's what we cannot do, we cannot spend eternity if I'm loving you but you're not loving me back. So you can understand, remember what John said, for God so loved the world that he gave someone as a testimony of his love. So when God deals with me, he is dealing with me in love. Even if he's chastening me, if he's correcting me, do you know why he corrects me? He corrects me because he loves me. That's what the writer said. Oh, how he loves me. He is jealous for me, and he loves like a hurricane. I am the tree bending beneath the weight and the wind of his mercy and glory. He loves us. He expresses love to us. This is what John said, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And when you read the Bible, you will see that God sent his son at a time when we were enemies with God. We hated God. But watch this. What someone does does not determine your ability to love them. Oh my, yes. We are looking for people to treat us right before we love them. That's not love. Love is actually, it's just shown what you choose to do with it, that's up to you. But it should not determine the ability that we have to love people. There are many scriptures that teach us this, that God, watch. There's people on the street that curse the name of God and God says, send them rain and let the sun rise over their lives. And that's what he teaches us, love your enemies. 
Can I repeat that again? Love your enemies the way I love them. Do good to those that despitefully use and might even abuse you, that you might be like your Father who is in heaven. Here's the third one I want you to consider. Whenever God is working in the world, He works through love. The greatest expression of the love of God goes like this. It's a man stretched out on, on a cross. That's God showing us greater love. A man laying down his life for his friends. I, I said, God, I don't think we were your friends, but I'm looking at it through the wrong optics. You love me regardless. I'm your enemy. You're not mine. He's the lover of our souls. By the way, when you understand how God loves us, it also helps you to parent. So that you don't parent using a skewed version. Love your children regardless. If they get locked up, love them. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because that's what God does. And what you're extending to them is that same love. And I'm going to show you before we finish here today that in the end, whether you believe it or not, if we wait long enough, we will see that love wins. It wins. In fact, in fact, love is greater than faith. It's greater than hope. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, love wins in the end. It wins in the end. He works through love. Here in his love, Marty, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The one whose blood would be sprinkled and covered our sins because he loved us. Let's go a little further now. This is what I was talking about earlier about the distinction between love and sex. Taught properly, sexual intimacy, and I've got to define it, between a husband and a wife was designed to express God's love through physical intimacy. That's what it was designed to do. Now, of course, there are offshoots and pleasures, but at the highest level, it was designed in that physical intimacy actually to teach you the love of covenant. This is one of the reasons why when God makes the male and female anatomy, he makes them in such a way that when they are engaged in sexual intimacy, they're literally, can I say this, one. He's shown you the power of love and covenant through this drive and desire. Watch this. But love transcends sex. All sex is not rooted in love. Or prostitutes would be the most loving people on the planet. Right? Some sex is rooted in lust. We have to know the difference. And be prepared only to, can I say this, engage in this with people that we are willing to love the way God loves. There'd be a lot less wounded people if we followed this pattern. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? Only engage with people that you're willing to love the way God loves. Here are seven truths, and we're, we're almost done. Seven truths about God's love. Remember this? We're going to remember the definition. Follow these truths here. Here's the first one. Love is sacrificial. But ju just don't write it like that. Remember, because love is God, or God is love rather, love is eternally and infinitely sacrificial. So it is not sacrificial Tuesday and then upset on Wednesday about having to sacrifice. Why do I always have to drive you to work? Can't you buy your own car? Love is infinitely sacrificial. Can I teach this? That is why the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Love is eternally and endlessly sacrificial. So watch, brothers and sisters, as God is developing your love quotient, he's also going to put people in your life that's going to test your level of sacrifice to see whether or not, watch, you are one-time sacrificers. <laughs> You know how we do it, right? You don't want to do it, so you say, well, by one offering, Jesus. <laughs> but what he's trying to tell you is as often, ready? As often as your brother needs a cloak, give it to him. It's eternally and infinitely sacrificial. I could open the altar right now for all of us because now what we understand is love stretches us and makes us more like God. 
and less like our fallen selves. It takes all the conditions off of these things and it shows people what God is like. And it tells me the things I need to pray about. Here's what Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. This is the key, as I have loved you. I have a, I have a struggle with the text because he's going to then show them later how he loves them. And when I was reading the Bible, I, I started looking at some things. I said, you know, when you read the Bible and you start seeing Jesus, he's manifesting the love of God. And he's so controlled because what it does is the love of God controls other impulses. And so what happens is, watch, he says in one verse, he says, I could call 12 legions of angels. That's what he said. I could do that. In another verse, they spit in his face. How many people in this room having that option to call angelic assistance would let people spit in your face? If that was me, I'd start swinging. Because I understand certain things about Jesus Christ. And I, I begin to see the level that he wants me to live at. That someone can spit in my face and I can still turn the other cheek. Love is infinitely sacrificial. It knows no limits on sacrifice. Watch closely. When you listen to the message, you will see how love properly taught and practiced can change the world by itself it can change the very fiber of the world not just the church the very fiber and fabric he goes on to say greater love than this hath no man that a man lay down his life doesn't force it he simply lays it down for his friends let's go to the second one love is endlessly tolerant watch closely it can bear some things. It bears things. It, it, it has the ability to endure some things. Watch closely. It doesn't, it doesn't, and we all do this. It doesn't give up when it gets tough. It bears things. It puts up with things. Even what it doesn't have to put up with, it simply says, because I love you. Now watch closely, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons why we don't really gravitate to love is because inherent in love, I'm going to show you in a minute, is kindness. And over the years, we have defined kindness as weakness. And no one wants to seem weak. If you listen to some people give counsel, you don't, watch, ready? Don't let him walk over you, girl. Right, and all of a sudden you're by yourself having no one to walk over you. Hmm? Love is uh, endlessly tolerant. Watch, ready? The word charity there is the King James way of saying love. Love suffers long. It suffers long because it's kind and it doesn't look over the fence at what others have. It suffers long. Oh, I hear you. I'm going to expedite. I'm going to expedite. The Lord has walked in the room. Love is kind. Please don't think that kind people are weak. In fact, the kindest people are the strongest people. Because it doesn't take anything to punch you in the eye. It doesn't take anything to tell you off. It takes something to hold all of that down and still love you. Oh my God. That's what Jesus does. The kindest people are the strongest people. We've developed all these philosophies. Ready? Nice guys finish last. Well, can I help you with that? The first shall be, and the last shall be. Love is kind. I feel God. It doesn't puff itself up. It's not puffed up, but it's kind. It's kind and it's also calm. Calm. I'm almost ready, Joel. Watch. This is one of the words that the Hebrews knew. This idea that God was kind is called chesed. His loving kindness. When I'm in trouble, his loving kindness is 
better than life. And the reason why many of us, including me, are still here praising God is because He's kind. Can anyone testify? The reason why you're here and no one knows what you did is because He covered you through kindness. He didn't expose you. He didn't put you out there. He covered you through kindness. Our God is kind. It's better than life. It's kind. Oh my God. Keep it going, Joel. Watch. Watch. Love is, here's my term. It's selflessly and thoughtfully good. It thinks about being good. How can I be good to someone? What can I do for someone? How can I hold that door? Though it's a small thing, how can I pick someone up? Let me tell you something. Our world, is it, goodness is, is foreign to our world. In fact, we're developing a world where people are afraid of each other. I'll tell you a quick story. I was driving, we were at Downsview Park. It was late, one cold, cold winter night. I was driving on Shepherd. I was going that way, going, that's uh, west, no, east, toward the Allen came to this stoplight here, Chestwood, there was a young black gentleman in the bus stop, freezing. I rolled down the window, foolishly thinking. I said, hey, could I give you a ride to the subway? He said, <laughs> and I realized the enemy, watch, has caused the love of many to wax. So that we're even afraid of, we can't believe that someone isn't trying to take us away somewhere, isn't trying to kidnap us, they're just trying to be kind. We've got to restore kindness back to the world. I'm almost through. It doesn't behave itself unseemly, it doesn't seek its own, it's not easily provoked, it thinks no evil, and it has all occasions to. Love takes no pleasure in falsehood. There's only one more, I think. So when you hear people talking about other people, say, stop it. Go tell someone else. Tell them, stop it. It takes no pleasure. It takes no pleasure because here's what you cannot do. When someone's talking about someone that's not there, you cannot validate it. You cannot prove it. You cannot test it because they're not there. And you and I know that it takes two witnesses for truth to be established. Tell them to find someone else. Go find someone else because love, it doesn't take any pleasure in falsehood. Here's the text in case. It doesn't rejoice when someone messes up. It doesn't go in the comment section and it doesn't do those things when, when a pastor falls. It doesn't rejoice in that. Don't care if it's your pastor or you. It doesn't rejoice in all. It hurts when people fall. Mm. I feel the Holy Spirit. It only rejoices in what can be proven. So it takes the time. Here's my last one, but I'm going to give you a thought. When I say something about him and he's not there, when it is all solved, here's what we don't do. We don't go back and fix that. And you cannot measure how many people are running with something that is not founded on anything. Hmm? Set a watch before my mouth, O oh God. Guard the doors to my lips. Love is supportively optimistic. It hopes all things. It continues to tell you. Like I sent a message to someone and they sent back, I was saying, you know, there's just so much challenges and, you know, they wanted to have someone come to the ministry and I sent back a message and I said, I, 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 I can't do it right now because the wherewithal is not there. And they simply sent back a message, I understand, but here's what I like what they said, it is well. That's what I mean, supportively optimistic. They're trying to tell you, it's gonna get better. Don't worry, don't die here. Better days are coming. Come on, lift, lift up your head. We're, we're, we're going to make it in Jesus' name. I, I, I see you coming out of this. Ooh, I see you on the other side of glory. Come on, hold on. Don't give up. I'm right here with you. Don't quit. Don't give up. It's supportively optimistic. It bears, read this with me. It bears all things. It believes all things. 
it hopes all things it in what kind of church is this what kind of kingdom is this what kind of people are these strange love it's xenos it's strange love it's not from this planet it's not from this world You know, I don't really listen to a lot of secular music, but there was a song that Stevie Wonder dropped, and I said, I kind of like it. Something like this. It says something about, as long as the ocean something, I'll be loving you always. You know that one? Well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, that's a nice song. I'll be loving you always. Is that called always? All right, I'll see if I can get a hold of that. You'll still come to the ministry, right? Here's the last one. Love is constructively corrective. It only corrects you because it wants to build you up, not to tear you down. It corrects you because it wants to see you better, not worse. It's correctively constructive. Glory to God. And we end here. The Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke them. The way so, well, the church I came up with, you know, the rebuke was kind of shameful. When God rebukes us, it's flowing with love. It's something that I think a lot of people have not felt before. It's a love that comes across and it hits the target. It brings conviction, but in that conviction, there's a feeling that the one convicting me loves me. And that's what God does. He chastens those whom he, he loves. In the end, brothers and sisters, I close here. Love is going to win. Be not overcome with evil, but we're going to overcome evil with good. I think there's a verse of scripture, and then we'll go home. We'll share some fellowship. Love never fails. So as much as I can prophesy, that's going to fail. If I speak in tongues, that's going to cease. Think about that. And where there's knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Now there's faith, there's hope, and there's love. But the greatest of these is the love of God.